Thank you for joining so our nice live stream. This morning. We will and begin. I see so many faces this morning for the first time in uh, a long time. Uh, really nice to have you here. This is a, a masks optional uh, area here in the auditorium. Uh, before exiting the auditorium, whether to go to the bathroom or, or uh, between uh, the Bible class and assembly, we'll just ask that you put your mask back on as all the other parts of the building are mask uh, required. Um, so I just want to remember that. Uh, good to be here with you. I, I didn't call on anyone to lead a prayer for us, but I wouldn't mind uh, uh, Sean Kogus, if you don't mind leading us in a word of prayer before we start. I can hear you always. You have a, a good voice. <laughs> See? <laughs> can you lead us in prayer? Awesome. Thank you. Dear Heavenly Father, as we come before you now, we are grateful for a beautiful morning that you have given. We thank you for this weekend. May we take time to remember those who have fallen. Lord, we are always so happy to hear Brother Stephen give a, a wonderful lesson. Pray that you give him good diction. Please be with him. We pray that you will bless West Maine in where we go and what we do. May we shine brightly and may we try to emulate you as best as we can. May we make you proud. We pray for a good worship this morning and in your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. So I want to take just a moment and look at where we've been and kind of where we're going in this class on the Holy Spirit. Uh, we've, we've talked about these topics over the course of the quarter so far. Uh, we will be looking at the baptism of the Holy Spirit today and then the miraculous gifts of the Holy Spirit next week. Uh, speaking in tongues, the gift of the Holy Spirit in Acts 2.38 and sins against the Holy Spirit. There, there are some things that, of course, cross over, uh, and there'll be times in which we'll have to delay a discussion because it's coming in a future lesson. Uh, so you may find that to be true today as well on a couple of things. Uh, today we're going to focus really on this idea of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And before we talk about that, just briefly, I'd like you to look in your Bible at Matthew chapter 10. This will not be on the board. Matthew chapter 10, verse 17. Matthew 10, verse 17. And I want us to look at just two quick verses here, and you could look at many verses in this way. But I want us to realize that context, context is important when attempting to understand written and verbal communication. If we do not take the time uh, to really bring to bear the context, the either immediate and surrounding context uh, of Scripture, we may miss the point. Uh, if I were just to pluck out Matthew ten seventeen and tell someone, beware of men, for they will deliver you over to courts and flog you in their synagogues. <laughs> what would you think just, you know, out of that, out of context? Am I supposed to fear men? You know, are, are women safe, but men are dangerous? Am I, am I really, are, am I going to be taken and, and, you know, flogged in synagogues today? And all those things, it's, it's complete uh, ridiculousness, right? Uh, you look at uh, Luke 12, Luke, Luke 12, 19, Luke 12, 19. Uh, and I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, and be merry. Well, if I just take verses out of their context and try to make application, we look at this as the spoken by Jesus uh, in a, a, a parable of a rich man. And this is the rich man's words in the parable. Jesus is teaching the lesson that he concludes with in Luke 12, 21. So is he who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. So if we just throw aside common sense and context, we can miss what our Lord is trying to reveal, what God is trying to reveal in his word. So let's keep that in the forefront of our minds that in all of these subjects and any study that we engage in, context is really, really important. We can be misled if we don't look at the context. Um, I, I know you've been told this probably from uh, preachers of, in the past and maybe even by Ben here. When we're reading the Bible, look at several verses ahead and several ver verses past what we're actually looking at and referring to and see if, if what we're understanding fits into the context of that passage. So I want to ask us a question here. Um, what, what does the word baptism mean? Uh, when we talk about the, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, what does baptism itself as a word mean? This is an easy one. Immersion. Immersion. Uh, it's, it's immersion. Baptisma. Uh, it means immersed. And in what contexts does the Bible speak of immersion? Not just in the context of baptism of the Holy Spirit, but what else does the Bible talk about when it refers to the word baptism? 
when it uses the word baptism, what kinds of immersions are we talking about here in the Bible? Yeah, water baptism. So we have water baptism, baptism in water. We have, what was, what was John? John's baptism what, of repentance. Uh, we, we, and his was in water as well as far as the medium. We think about baptism of fire. Uh, we th see that uh, Jesus refers to his suffering on the cross as a baptism in Luke twelve forty nine through 50. Uh, so this is a term that's used to relate to immersion in something. Immersion. So we're talking about immersion of the Holy Spirit, being immersed in it, this baptism of the Holy Spirit. And what is baptism likened to in Romans 6, 3 through 4 and Colossians 2, 12? What is it likened to? A burial. Burial. As an immersion is a burial coming up. It's immersed. To undergo the baptism of the Holy Spirit means to be immersed in the Holy Spirit and His power. The Holy Spirit is not the administrator the one who does the baptizing, it, he is the element, that in which one is baptized when we're talking about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So um, I want to look at just a few aspects of this today, and I hope that we'll kind of answer some of these questions uh, as we go through. These are the premises that, that I'm coming to you with, that the Bible, I believe, teaches. How is this Holy Spirit baptism imparted? I believe it was sent by Christ from God, uh, to whom we'll find the Bible reveals it's to the apostles and to Cornelius and his household. When did this happen? Apostles on Pentecost, Cornelius and his household before their baptism in water, they were actually received the Holy Spirit baptism. And then Paul received his uh, later as an apostle. Uh, we see three cases of the Holy Spirit baptism, of course, if we include Paul here, uh, which is an apostle. Purpose, revelation, confirmation of truth, guidance, it's as a sign. We see the results when someone was baptized in the Holy Spirit, that they spoke in tongues when it was received. Of course, the apostles received a full measure of the Holy Spirit, being able to work miracles and signs, yet there's no evidence revealed in the Scriptures that Cornelius and his household were able to do anything other than speak in tongues as a sign. Was this to be ongoing past the first century? Uh, I believe the Bible teaches this is temporary. These were limited to the apostles and Cornelius, his household, and we have no evidence in the Bible to suggest that others were given spiritual gifts in any other way by, except by the laying on the hands of the apostles uh, later on. So these are the premises I'm coming with from my study in the Scriptures as to what I believe, just so there's no doubt uh, in your mind as to where I'm going uh, if my diction is not proper in some of these things. Jesus is the administrator uh, of the Holy Spirit baptism. Uh, we look at some passages here. These are on the board. You can look on your Bibles, of course, and look more of the context that we're speaking to here. Uh, John 1, 32 through 34, John says of Christ uh, that he says, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. This is referring to Christ, the one whom the Spirit had descended on and remains. Uh, we see John proclaimed this, that Jesus would baptize with the Holy Spirit. We look at Matthew three eleven through 12. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. We look at John fourteen twenty six, which have been some familiar passages to us in the class. The Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name. So we see that the Holy Spirit, the Father will send in the name of Christ. Uh, we look at John fifteen twenty six, whom I shall send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father. He will testify of me. Uh, the Holy Spirit baptism uh, that we see that's most prominent here, the one of the apostles, took, took place in Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. And we'll read those verses here in just a moment. But we see that when questioned about the events that were surrounding this baptism, Peter said it was Jesus who had poured forth what they were seeing and hearing in verse 32 and 33 of that chapter. Uh, so we see that it was actually sent by Christ. The baptism of the Holy Spirit was a promise. And this New Testament uh, you know, that we have teaches the baptism of the Holy Spirit was a promise. It, it wasn't a command to be fulfilled. And I believe this is a, an important distinction in one way. Uh, promises are to be received and enjoyed while commands are to be obeyed. So why would this distinction be important for us to understand that commands are to be obeyed and promises are, be, are to be delivered on? Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. So we were commanded to be baptized in water for the mission of our sins, in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. But we weren't commanded to be baptized into the Holy Spirit or receive Holy Spirit baptism. And some may think that they have to be baptized in the Holy Spirit, meaning receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit in, in order to be a Christian or to be saved because they've been taught that from some other teacher. But the Bible does not teach that. Uh, if we look at... Uh, Acts 1, one uh, Acts 1, 4 through 5 and, and verse 8. Let's read this together. This is when this occurs here, this Holy Spirit baptism, um, uh, the promise of the occurrence of it, anyway, that occurs in Acts 2. This is Jesus promising it. And look who this is promised to. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea, Samaria, and to the end of the earth. Water baptism is a command of the Lord to be obeyed. No one ever uh, obeyed a command to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. Individuals received this baptism from the Lord. So why did the apostles receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Why did they receive it? Yeah, it was promised to begin with, right? They were promised it, and they received it so that they would be guided in all truth and all the, the fulfillment of what Jesus had promised to them that would come. This was made to the apostles. It wasn't to all mankind. This promise was made. He told them to wait. The baptism would give them power. It would equip them to do the work of an apostle, uh, to bear witness of his resurrection, to preach the gospel in his name to all nations, uh, and we, we noticed in lesson number five previously, we took note of a special relationship between the Holy Spirit and the apostles. They would enjoy a measure of the Holy Spirit not promised to all men that would equip them to do their work. Uh, this power or measure of the Holy Spirit was given to them in Acts chapter 2 uh, when they were baptized in the Holy Spirit by Christ. No one else received the Holy Spirit measure. This purpose, I think you can see lots of purposes in the Scripture and I've got just several here. I've grouped them. The first five, these are related to direct statements, as Justin just men mentioned one of them, to guide them into all truth. But they were to also be given this Holy Spirit to remember what the Spirit had said, to know all things to come, to convict the world of sin through their word, to bear witness or confirm the word. And then we see in Acts chapter 2 some evidence of, of what occurred, and we see that they were equipped to do their work. They were revealing and confirming the truth. They were guided at all truth. They were given power to work miracles. They were working miracles. Uh, they were designated as the apostles, God's messengers to all people to hear the word. They were the ones to announce salvation was to come. The, um, they were to impart the ability to work miracles to others, give them spiritual gifts by laying on of their hands. The baptism of the Holy Spirit did not save the apostles. That was not how they were saved and we'll find it did not save Cornelius and his household either who had gathered to hear the message taught by Peter that's an important point we don't want to fall prey to this false idea that we have to be baptized of the Holy Spirit in order to be saved we're not going to receive this Holy Spirit baptism we were never promised it it was never promised that we would receive this power we look at John 14, 15, and 16, and remember a few things here. He will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. In John 15, 26, the spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will testify of me. John 16, 13, he will guide you into all truth. Who was Jesus speaking to in John 14 through 16? Who was he speaking to? The apostles. We read that in, in Matthew 26, 20. Mark 14, 17, and Luke 22, 14, in a previous lesson, John provides us more detail, but Mark, Matthew, Matthew, Mark, and Luke also tell us specifically who was at this gathering, consisting of Jesus and the 12 apostles. So we don't have any doubts in our mind. That's who this promise was made to. It was not to all mankind. Uh, we also see recorded that many wonders and signs were being done by the apostles and having been baptized in the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. So we see evidence of this in the scriptures. Acts 2.43, Then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. 
We see this in Romans 15, 17, by the power of signs and wonders, by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem and all the right way to Elycrium, I have fulfilled the ministry of the gospel of Christ. We see this in 2 Corinthians 12, 12. Truly the signs of an apostle were accomplished among you with all perseverance in signs and wonders and mighty deeds. Uh, we see this in the Revelation in Ephesians 3, as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to his holy uh, apostles and prophets. And we see again in 1 Peter 1, 10 through 12, but to us they were ministering the things which now have been reported to you through those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things which angels desire to look into. Is there anything in this, in this idea, what I propose to you, anything that you see is out of line with Scripture? I'm speaking to a, a, a group of brothers and sisters in Christ here and maybe some visitors here who are unbelievers, but the vast majority of you have studied these things and have looked into these things for yourself and developed your own convictions over these things. So are there things in what I've presented to you very quickly um, that you disagree with or that you find, hmm, Brother Estes, I think you're off. I don't think the Bible teaches this. I think it, it goes a different direction. I just want to make sure that, that we're all pulling the same direction from what we read in Scripture with this specific topic. It seems as though this topic is plucked out of Scripture and used by people of the world to justify positions that people can speak in tongues today or that they have some special gift or special knowledge given to them or they've been baptized or they need to be baptized in the Holy Spirit in order to be a, a Christian in fellowship with God. And uh, So that's the purpose of why we're really talking about this, in spe this specific topic today because the world has misused this so so poorly. I mean, they've just misused it. So uh, tell me, what, what have I missed? What have I missed in this? We have several preachers in the audience as well. What have we missed on this specific topic of what the Bible, because I want to go through the objections. What do people try to use to, to influence you to think something differently or to try to convince you to think another way? But before we go there, yeah. So you're speaking to the purpose, the purpose behind this Holy Spirit baptism. It wasn't to elevate them as men above other men in their own right, and so, so to speak. It was to deliver the word. It was to confirm the word. It was to guide them so that we could have this revealed to us. We don't, we don't need anything else uh, as far as miraculous power today. It's been confirmed. We have, the, we have all this recorded. I think what pops into my mind, Dane, as, as you were making your comment, is, speaking, is thinking about how Jesus handled the temptations from Satan in Matthew chapter 4. He, Jesus himself did not enrich himself through his power, his deity. 
He could have satisfied his hunger. He could have done all sorts of things, but it, that was against his purpose here. Just the way the apostles weren't using these gifts to demonstrate their power or have something that was intrinsic to them. It was always about glorifying God, confirming the word that they were revealed by God to verify. I mean, imagine if we did not have the New Testament today, how would we know that men that would come to us would be from God? You would want the same, you would want confirmation. You would want something to tell you, this man is a prophet. This man is speaking from God. This man is speaking on behalf of God. And so the purpose there to me is, is obvious. And it was only promised to those men, the apostles, because that's all that was necessary. It wasn't needful that the Holy Spirit baptism be upon all men. And it wasn't promised to be upon all men. Um, now, were there other gifts? We're going to talk about this next week. Gifts that were given to others through the laying on the hands of the apostles? Absolutely. That was needful. But the Holy Spirit gave to those as he willed. It wasn't as if this person was instilled with some power that was self-serving or to elevate them in the minds of other men. Um, the elevation, we find, came from men seeking gifts that they thought were more impressive because they were more obvious and exposed to others, like speaking in tongues. Uh, we'll find that out in a couple of weeks as well. Uh, I think that was the, what you're really trying to get at is the purpose of it, and we ought to be satisfied with the wonderful blessings we have in our relationship with God. We have this relationship today, and the purpose of those Holy Spirit gifts were to help us understand how to achieve that relationship, and we have it. We have it. The miraculous gifts are not necessary. One other person had their hand up, I think, yeah. 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 Which would be applicable to both the Holy Spirit baptism, the, the apostles, what the power they had, and also those that had their hands laid upon them that wasn't going to be necessary at a future date. And we'll talk about that more next week. That's coming next week, too. Uh, I saw one other hand, and then we'll move on so we don't run out of time to cover that. Someone have their hand up over here? All right, great. I really appreciate your comments. I truly do. Um, I, I, this seems to me like it's a more direct, more easily understood concept than some of the things we've talked about so far. So I don't want to belabor it, uh, but let's, let's look at this objection, uh, number one, that was offered in the book. Uh, when people want to try to defy what the scriptures teach, some may say, well, you know, all of the believers receive the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 2. Acts 1.15 says there were about 120 disciples in Jerusalem during that time. The arguments made that the Holy Spirit did not just fall upon the 12 apostles, but upon all these disciples. How would you answer that? <clears throat> how would you answer that objection? If someone talked to you about that, how, what would you say to them? And it doesn't have to be a complete argument. Just what's, what's one thing that you can think of that you go, hey, that, that's not really, that's not true. Because there's something else I know that's taught about in the, in the scriptures about this. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So you see, you see what Justin's talking about here is following those pronouns that, you know, the, the chapter divisions are inserted by men. So if you look at what was going on, they had appointed this, this replacement for Judas. And so it goes on to talk about what was spoken to those same apostles as they gathered with Jesus to, before his ascension uh, to talk through those things. That's one argument. I, I think that's a very valid argument. What's well, something else you could think of that might be a good argument that is biblically based to contradict a false teaching like that? Think about the promise. To me, this is always so important. Who was it promised to? Right? So, yeah, the apostles. Think about, oh, just remember John 14, 15, 16. Go through that chapter and, and look at it. It's, and we've already proven beyond any doubt 
that that is exactly who Jesus was speaking with. That's exactly who he was talking with that night. And he promised this to them. He didn't promise this to the masses. He didn't promise this to 120 people. Um, you know, the recipients of the baptism of the Holy Spirit were the apostles. Uh, just a few other things to think through. Uh, when the, uh, uh, the multitude was marveling there, saying to one another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? Well, is, is it highly likely that all 120 Christians there were all Galileans? Well, I think that's unlikely. They're referred to as men of Galilee. Were there, were there women among the people there, the 120? If there were, this, this kind of begs the question, well, how could it refer to all of them uh, receiving the Holy Spirit? Um, think about this idea that their denial of the drunkenness. Uh, the, the, you remember what they were saying? These men are drunk. They're speaking in tongues. They're, they must be drunk. That was invalidated because they could actually understand what was being spoken. They were not drunk. And Peter refers to this and, and basically denies those charges against the apostles there. Um, why did they not accuse, accuse all the disciples of being drunk? Well, why is it only the apostles that were being accused if the Holy Spirit baptism really went to all 120 people there? Um, think about the audience responding to, in remorse after Peter finishes the message, it, said un, it says, said unto Peter in verse 37, and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Why was that addressed to just the apostles? Why are they just pleading with the apostles as to what to do? What had they displayed that they had special over the others that were there, that were followers? Uh, think about the uh, obedient believers there, continuing steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. Why didn't it say they were continuing steadfastly in the doctrine of all the brethren? No one else had the Holy Spirit gifts. It was just the apostles. There were many wonders and signs that were done by the apostles. Uh, and look at Acts 4.33. And with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection and wrought by the hands of the apostles in Acts 5.11 where many signs and wonders wrought. It's not until Acts 6 that any other people are working any miracles and only after the apostles had laid their hands on them. Why do we not read about all these other miracles that are going on by all these other people that got, because they weren't happening. It was only by the apostles that were working miracles after the Holy Spirit baptism that they had received until they had the time in which they were laying their hands on others in Acts 6 and beyond. Then you see others working miracles. So to me, it's just, um, it's observable. Uh, and also it's observable today. Have you seen people working many signs and wonders and miracles today who have said, I've received the Holy Spirit baptism? Wow, well, are you working miracles? Are you working signs and wonders to confirm what you're saying? What's the only one that you hear that people, you hear people you know, are healing others, but it's through these faith healers. And I love Stu's story. He always talks about somebody who come to the ER you know, after having been to a faith healing convention, and he was one of the faith healers, and he came to the ER because he hurt himself. Well, why didn't he just heal himself? Huh. You know, and you think about observable things. What's, what's the other one that everybody throws out? Oh, I have the Holy Spirit baptism. I can speak in tongues. Well, I, what language are you speaking? It's some angelic language. Well, that's not what was going on when they received the Holy Spirit baptism in the, in the New Testament. The apostles were speaking known languages that were understood. And in the case of Cornelius, they were understood to be magnifying God in the words they spoke. It was understood language. It's just observable. It, it's, it's no wonder that some who would claim to have been baptized by the Holy Spirit would try to make these claims and not others because it's not happening. It's not real. Uh, that just doesn't happen today. It's really the, the meager attempts that are made are the only ways they can just try to pass it off as having happened. Um, let's look at the second objection uh, that's mentioned in the book. It says here, John taught that Jesus would baptize all men with the Holy Spirit. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I'm not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. So what's, what's something, just one argument or something you may have thought to yourself in doing your lesson that how would you talk to someone who was making that claim? What would you tell them? What would you say to them from the Word of God? 
Yeah, Stu. Context. Read the next verse. Just keep going. Keep reading a little bit. Uh, he's talking about this. This fire is, of course, not related to uh, the Holy Spirit baptism. Uh, this is talking about this chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. Hell is an immersion in fire. Remember the definition: immersion in. Uh, so to be immersed in fire in the scriptures is usually speaking of judgment of some sort. Um, but we know he talks about everlasting fire in Matthew 18, 8, and talking about uh, the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels in Matthew 25, 41. Jesus was not promising that everybody would receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit and the baptism of fire. He was talking about the baptisms that Jesus was going to be administering. Some men would be baptized by Jesus with the Holy Spirit, and some would be baptized with fire and judgment in the end. We learn from other passages that the baptism of the Holy Spirit was promised to just the apostles. Well, when you try to make this apply more broadly, um, it's modified by what else is taught in the Scriptures. You don't just pluck something out and go, well, there it is. It's all men. Well, no, it's very specific as to who this promise was delivered to. Uh, other arguments or comments that you may have on that one? Yeah. Yes, excellent, excellent. Yes, it's carried over into, into Acts 1, and it's just the apostles. Yeah, great. Um, that's really good. Uh, objection um, number three. The prophecy of Joel, quoted by Peter in Acts 2, says the Holy Spirit would be poured out on all flesh. Thus, all believers are to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. How would you, how would you argue that from the Scriptures and try to help someone who believes this. What do you think? Kind of a similar argument that we've been making, right? Some of the, these arguments are they're pretty well answered with what we've been talking about in John 14, 15, 16, much of the time. What else might you think of? Yeah, Stu? Yes. Yes. It, it's an explanation of amazing things. The crowds are witnessing. The baptism of the Holy Spirit upon the apostles was a fulfillment of this prophecy in Joel. It's referenced there. Only the apostles were baptized, but it empowered the apostles, as Stu was just talking about, to perform a work that would benefit all flesh. It was being seen. It's openly no, known. And some believers would receive miraculous gifts in a limited measure in the future, uh, through the laying on the hands, but all flesh received the gospel message inspired by the Holy Spirit through the preaching of the apostles and extending the invitation that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And then lastly, which we may have to finish next week, we've only got a couple more minutes, uh, this fourth objection, what about the household of Cornelius? Tell me some things, we only have a couple minutes. Uh, for those of you who have read the, the text there in Acts uh, regarding this event, um, what was happening when the apostles, uh, excuse me, describe what was happening um, during this Holy Spirit baptism of Cornelius and his family. What was, what was the result of that? When they, when they received the Holy Spirit baptism, what happened? What was evidence of it? Yes, so it was a sign. And how do we know they received it? They were speaking in tongues. And as we already mentioned, they could be understood. It was spoken languages. And it was a sign to whom? Jews, Jews the apostles. Yes. The, the, the Jews needed to see the sign that, yes, they are accepted. They are able to receive the, the message of the gospel and be saved. Um, what event did Peter liken this to? He says, yeah. Holy Spirit fell on upon them as upon us at the beginning. How did they display that the Holy Spirit baptism had occurred 
They were speaking in tongues. Found them the same way. This is, this is from God. This is a sign from God. We'll finish this uh, discussion of Cornelius and read the text and go through a little bit more next week. And let's all come prepared uh, to study the lesson number 10, the miraculous gifts of the Holy Spirit. Thank you so much. I appreciate your participation.